So this is our first podcast from another country. Um, you're gonna have to believe us, but we're in San Francisco. We, we've been traveling around, we've done a lot of interviews with a lot of people. We've got a few ideas for some new documentaries. And we're gonna show you a picture now of the Rebel Wisdom Mobile. And yeah, let you know some of the people that we've been seeing. So we've seen Akira, the Don. Uh, he's got some amazing plans for an intellectual dark web Marvel Cinematic Universe, so Intellectual Dark Wave. We've seen Jordan Greenhall, Daniel Schmachtenberger, this kind of next level futurist kind of guy. And also, as insisted by our supporters in the la after our last podcast, Paul van der Klee, um, a pastor who's done a lot of stuff about Jordan Peterson. We went to see a couple of days ago. And we went to one of his services as well. Yeah, we went to one of his sermons. Um, so we filmed some of his sermon. We filmed a really good interview with him. Um, so huge amounts of content coming up. And for this podcast, we're also going to talk about psychedelics. Because today in particular, why don't you t say who we saw today? Yeah, so today was um, Jim Fadiman, who is one of the basically is known as the, the father of microdosing. He's really, um, uh, I would say, a psychedelic elder. He's been around, you know, doing research really from the beginning. Um, and microdosing in particular has become uh, very popular um, and really beneficial for a lot of people in terms of creativity, but also in terms of people using it uh, for anxiety and depression. So it was a really, really interesting conversation and, and a lovely man as well. Um, and then we saw Eric Davis who is one of my favorite thinkers, actually, Eric Davis. Um, he describes himself as having a, a PhD in high weirdness, but his, his PhD is actually in religious studies. Um, and he really looks at the intersection between technology and kind of the religious impulse and tribes and subcultures. Um, very, you know, one of his famous books is called Technosis. So it's a really interesting kind of intersection between all those ideas. It's kind of about how the religious impulse comes up through technology and is kind of a big part of, yeah, the sort of tech subculture. Yeah. So, and I think, it, yeah, we want to sort of fill in the gaps, explain why. So we've now done, we did the Michael Pollan interview, which we called the Psychedelic Renaissance about three weeks ago. And then we did an interview with Jamie Wheel, who is a, a flow states expert, also talks a lot about psychedelics. And this is something that we have, yeah, it's a big interest of ours. Um, we, we both got kind of a history with the Psychedelic Festival Breaking Convention, and it's one of those areas of real kind of a sense of sort of possibility for shifting ways of thinking and shifting culture. And I think that's why we're interested mm. in it. Uh, and especially there's a lot of talk right now and, and I guess we're both firm believers in the importance of being able to move beyond ideology to have generative conversations um, you know something starting to see in the intellectual dark web it seems absolutely essential if we're going to find direction in the kind of chaotic times we live in and psychedelics more than any other thing I know about are deconditioning agents um, and decondition ideology incredibly well. However, they can go both ways. And so that's, that's part of the really interesting synchronicity is that Michael Pollan's book has come out um, and really bringing to the mainstream um, for, maybe not for the first time, but in a, in a very new way, the, the power of these substances. And so then the other questions are, how does one use them correctly? And how, yeah, how do we navigate it? Because obviously, you know, we're sitting right now in San Francisco and in the late 60s, there really was um, a massive mainstreaming of psychedelics that didn't go all that well. It had its benefits, it had massive downfalls as well. So, you know, that's kind of an open question I guess we've been asking people about and toying with ourselves is how do we use them most effectively moving forward? Mm. Yeah, we're literally about half a mile from Haight-Ashbury, mm. from literally the intersection of Haight-Ashbury, which was ground zero for the 60s. And the interesting question because we've talked about kind of ideological uh, fixation. And the interesting question is they were countercultural agents in the 60s, kind of the 1950s and 1960s. The, there was a very sort of firm cultural kind of traditionalist culture, and they were, a, they were one of the big things that, that challenged that. So the question that we're asking is, are they still deconditioning agents? Or is, because the ideology that we're in nowadays is a very different kind of ideology. 
And I think we've all, we've, we've, we've done a lot of films and a lot of conversations about the nature of this new ideology. Are they still those kind of deconditioning agents, given the fact that the new ideology is, is much more the ideology that actually emerged from the 60s? And we could argue, we do argue, has kind of become corrupt. It, it started, um, we've used Ken Wilber's work quite a lot, talking about it started as a very positive development, the, what he calls the green meme, which is equality and, um, and relativism and listening to other voices and including marginalized perspectives. That is a good thing, but then it became corrupt and became an ideology in its own right. And do psychedelics still play the same role that now that they played then? Mm. Yeah, and as we've been kind of asking people about it and, and thinking about it as well, and even as you're talking, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm kind of inquiring into that myself. I'm like, yeah, actually, I do think that they can um, still decondition from any ideology. You know, if you, if you look at shamanism throughout history, psychedelics have been used for war. They've been used for peace. They've been used to heal. They've been used to harm. Uh, the, you know, Jim Fadiman, who, who we saw today, is, is a big proponent of a real core aspect of um, psychedelic usage, which is setting and set. So setting is where you are, obviously, and set is what you're bringing to it yourself. And those two things can really have a, a big, big impact on it. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, you know, part of the interesting, one interesting question is how do we create the kind of setting and set now moving forward where a lot more people are probably going to try psychedelics that's conducive to moving away from ideology rather than deeper in to the ideology we're in now because that could happen and that would be not a good thing yeah because we my question to michael pollan was is your book a moment where psychedelics become mainstream and he kind of said that it was and pretty much everyone we've spoken to since we've been here have agree has agreed that yes this is a very significant moment a new york times best selling writer has written a best selling book about psychedelic therapy people are people who have never tried psychedelics are saying wow i'm 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 interested to try this it definitely is that crossover point so we've kind of been part of this conversation for i guess 10 years or so i first did did a story about psychedelic therapy back in 2008. Um, you've been part of the Breaking Convention Festival for a long time. So I guess what we're interested in doing is, is pushing that conversation on. Okay, now the mainstream is starting to recognize the value of psychedelics. Okay, fine. But what that in itself is not, that's not the end point. The end point, like I, I've always been very frustrated with the psychedelic community of almost like fetishizing the psychedelic experience and not learning the deeper lessons of the psychedelic experience, which even going back to Aldous Huxley was psychedelics cleanse the doors of perception, but you see things, so they remove a lot of filters, so you see a lot of things more true to how they are. How do, you, how do we start to live in that space? How do we start to live beyond the psychedelic experience and not just kind of psych um, yeah, um, fetishize the drug and fetishize that state of mind, and actually work on, because I, I firmly believe, and this has been absolutely true for me, that we have to do the inner work. Psychedelics, we get a few freebies, we get a few kind of insights into how things could be beyond our conditioning, beyond, wow, I'm one with the universe, I, I know what my, my true nature is, all that sort of stuff, and it's like, yes, great, true, but it's an ever-decreasing circle if you keep just doing the drug without doing the inner work, to really identify the blocks in yourself that stop you being in that space, not not necessarily all the time, but what are the things that are that are stopping you from from being in that state of flow in the rest of your life? Yeah, and this is something that so in the last two, breaking convention happens every two years, and the last two so starting in 2013, I think this has been the the topic I've written and, and spoken about, which is um, I've called the psychedelic shadow. It's this idea that. Well, so, so in kind of summary, you can take psychedelics for 20 years and be having these peak experiences, which I would call vertical, this kind of up and down. Um, and you can still, um, Jim Fadiman put it nicely, you can still want to kill someone when they cut you off when you're driving. 
uh, and you can still, you know, he, he also had a nice example. It's like, you, you, you love everything, but I hate my parents, you know? So there's something missing there. And this is something I started to see first in myself. And then what actually helped me kind of get out of it a bit was having a really dark experience and encountering my shadow and realizing, oh, it's not all love and light. So what I've kind of, I'm loosely developing is, is a model I call train, trip, integrate, which is the idea that not, you don't just need the horizontal, you need what you were just talking about, the, sorry, the vertical, you need the horizontal as well. And the horizontal is the kind of work, uh, so work where you, in, you, you work with other people, like kind of various types of therapy, body work, meditation, a lot of different ways of understanding yourself and how you relate to other people to get away from the potential narcissism and away from the potential um, lack of development that comes with just tripping and tripping and tripping. Um, and that is something that the psychedelic community, I think, needs to really look at. It's something Jamie Wheel was talking about. Um, and I think what he said that was really, really interesting, that really struck a chord with me, was that you know, he, he's traditionally come from the kind of ecstasis, the, those ecstatic moments, and how do you get into that kind of place, and how does that then lead to being in a flow state? Jordan Peterson is really bringing up the catharsis, the lower levels, and it's all hard one, kind of feels this kind of deep practical wisdom, and it really feels like that's been missing from the psychedelic world. It's all, you know, a lot of the time it's all love and light and crystals and bollocks like that. And what it needs is the real encounter with the shadow. And on that point, that's, that's one of the, the points I made in what I wrote at Breaking Convention is that the traditions like meditation, they don't generally look at the shadow in their traditional usage, something Ken Wilbur, Wilbur points out. You can meditate for 50 years as well and still be a massive asshole because you're not looking at the sides of yourself that you reject necessarily. So you need something or some combination of practices that allows you to own your shadow, allows you to know how to connect with other people in a way and have reflection on yourself, and then also allows you to break into spaces where you think differently and where you can break free from your constricted thought structures. So the point being, it's not as simple as people just taking psychedelics. A lot more has to go into it. Yeah, I just had a sort of thought. Truth is a psychedelic. Truth is a psychedelic experience. And this is something that Jordan Peterson talks about, um, that aligning oneself with the truth is, is what, that's the deepest story of Western culture, that's the logos. And magical things happen when we align ourselves with the truth. I never really framed it in that way, but that has certainly been my journey since I did a lot of psychedelics at university and found it a really, awakening experience at first, but I went through that experience of ever-decreasing circles and actually it took me quite a long time to recover from that sort of chasing that high and feeling, I kind of coined the phrase, living in the shadow of myself. Mm. Getting this sort of sense of who I could be beyond all of this stuff, just our stuff that we live in on a daily basis, um, and chasing that high and chasing that experience, but then always coming down and, and still still really struggling with with various things and it, almost it being worse because I had a, a taste of what it would have been like without all of the kind of the day-to-day -day stuff mm -hmm. and it wasn't until I started doing a lot of personal growth work inner work that I then started to kind of identify those places in myself okay this is where I shut down this is where I got this kind of swing between grandiosity and worthlessness and all of these personality patterns that yeah I got from my parents, I got from, from my, yeah, it, it, all of this sort of boring individual stuff that we all have that kind of keeps us trapped in some ways. Mm -hmm. And it was only by doing all of that inner work that I really started to kind of align all those parts of myself. And it, it, the space that opens up for me in a, in, a, in a workshop of sort of five or six days when I'm really sort of speaking my truth and really like dredging stuff up and really identifying it is a psychedelic experience. And at the risk of kind of giving a plug for our workshops, that is what comes in with two or three days in a workshop experience, you find a lot of these, yeah, it, it becomes this very powerful transformative where you can feel the, you can feel in, in, in the room like that, that level of what? Truth, magic, it, 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 it's, it's a similar space. Yeah. 
And so it's a flow state in, in that yeah. sense, yeah. And yeah, that's a really nice point because for me and, and for people who do psychedelic therapy professionally as well, the truth is absolutely the key element of the experience that's, that's curative because um, you can't hide on a psychedelic. You can't hide from yourself. And the truth is inner truth. It's not so much the truth of, oh, this is how the universe is all constructed, um, because you can't really share that with other people. You know, it's about your, your own inner truth. So it's around, you know, phenomenologically, you're sitting and something's coming up, some kind of negative feeling, and you have to acknowledge and go into it. It's like, this is true. You might not want it to be true, but it's true. It's happening. And whatever is coming up psychologically is true for you. It, you know, and whatever it is in psychedelic therapy, they always say, go into it. You know, my, my wife is currently training as a sitter in one of the studies, and they say in the training, you know, someone might be experiencing s serious paranoia. And what they say is, great, go into it. Go right into the paranoia. Get paran you know, real, and they're, you know, they're holding you in a context. Probably not, yeah, no, that is the way you deal with it. That is the way you go into it. It's this real love of the truth, and you have to kind of have that same attitude in a psychedelic experience or, or in a workshop experience. Yeah, and very much Jim Fadiman was saying that today. Um, so yeah, to, to kind of wrap this up, um, the, the, we're, we're thinking about, we're, we're definitely going to continue doing a lot of interviews with um, psychedelic therapists, psychedelic thinkers, because this is yeah, this is, this is an area that we're both interested in. We both think has got a real value for, for the culture. Yeah, so and then just some final housekeeping to close. Um, we've started using the community tab at long last. So if you want to keep up with, with what we're up to and what content is coming up on the channel, um, go on that tab. Uh, we've already posted a couple of things from the trip. Um, and then also this podcast, um, due to popular demand, is going to be audio only as well as video only. Um, so we're going to have that set up. So you won't have to look at us. You won't have to look at us, yeah. <laughs> we'll have that ready to set up for this podcast and then all the previous ones will be on there as well.